So when we start looking at our first subject of what's backflow, we find it very interesting that for many of us, communicating information about backflow is sometimes a difficult task. And some of the tools that Victor pointed out, some of the brochures, uh, PowerPoint presentations can really be a great tool for you to help communicate to people. Because we find many times that it really depends on the audience that you're dealing with. Uh, many times you're talking to people within the water industry, they understand water distribution issues, uh, and you can address things on a level that you know maybe they will understand more thoroughly. But probably one of our biggest challenges, of course, is talking to the general public or uh, other lay people who maybe aren't fully aware of uh, the water distribution system and some of the challenges that we have in protecting it from the hazards such as cross connections. We also find that uh, the general knowledge uh, from people in the industry, uh, there may be very segmented type uh, folks who are working in one area of our water distribution systems and they truly don't understand some of the global type issues uh, that they may be faced with. And we also find quite a bit of misunderstanding. When we talk to folks about cross-connection control issues, many times they bring some baggage with them that it's hard to, to break that uh, misconception. We had the opportunity a number of years ago at a large meeting, uh, we were invited in to talk about the cross-connection control issues and try to explain it on a, on a pretty entry level. And we were informed that, keep in mind, many of the people at this meeting were uh, highly educated people, many PhDs in the audience. However, they were from the lay people from their own respective uh, industries and backgrounds, and they may not truly understand uh, what a cross-connection is, how backflow occurs. So we were encouraged to, in preparation for this meeting to really make sure we try to make it as as graphic as possible so people could understand. Probably one of the first things as we were putting this presentation together was trying to get people to understand that it takes a number of uh, issues happening simultaneously for a backflow incident to occur. Many people were under the impression the fact that we just have the cross connection, the garden hose hanging in a bucket of chemicals, or a piece of equipment that's connected to the distribution system. Just that inner connection or the cross connection wasn't enough. We needed to have the hazard. And not only that, we also needed to have the hydraulic condition, something to actually move that hazardous material into the drinking water system. So it's indicated in this Venn diagram, that red area in the middle is where those three uh, issues coincide and it only is at that point that we truly get a backflow incident that occurs. So this is where we find many times people don't understand that the three uh, parts of this Venn diagram have to happen concurrently for a backflow incident. We then wanted to take it a step further and talk about really how does a backflow incident affect a water distribution system. So a very simplified water distribution system was illustrated you can see in this uh, illustration, it shows a water treatment plant in the upper left. It shows a very simplistic water distribution system and then water users, both industrial, commercial, as well as residential. And then as we kind of set this into motion to show that as water leaves the treatment plant, flows through the distribution system, the water, as we would interpret here, goes to the end user, to that customer. And I think everybody understood this very easily. Obviously, it's a very simplistic distribution system illustration here. Uh, complex, complex distribution systems, uh, grids, et cetera, uh, make this look very simplistic. But what we really wanted to show is, in this case, there are times when the distribution system could be compromised. So now as we show that distribution system, and there is something that occurs. There's a leak in the system main breaks, uh, we could have flushing operations, pump failures, uh, uh, other operation and maintenance issues. Uh, we may have increased demand at any point, such as a firefighting effort. And I think most would recognize these are common day-to-day -day operational issues within a water distribution system. And how could that possibly change 
how water is flowing through the distribution system. Well, because of that demand, perhaps in that one area of the distribution system, we're gonna to tend to have a lowering of the pressure. And because of that, water is gonna to wanna to tend to flow to that low pressure area. And as you see the red dots flowing from the water user's premises, that is the actual backflow event, where we have the undesirable reversal of flow from the customer's premises into the water distribution system. And it was kind of interesting during this meeting when we presented this initially, a number of the people at this meeting at that point admitted, oh, that's what backflow is? They didn't quite have that perception that the pollution or contamination within a customer's premises could travel out into the distribution system. So it was a very easy graphic illustration to show how this occurred. So I think that was one of the first barriers to get it across in a very simplistic form. How is backflow actually occurring in a water distribution system? So we show that that has entered the system. Now, in discussing the actual subject of the backflow, uh, the difficulty is we know that backflow is very transient in nature. It could be here one day and gone the next. It can recur. So if the actual conditions reoccur in a similar fashion, that backflow could happen again. So this is the difficulty we have in tracing backflow events. After the actual backflow has occurred, pollutional or contaminational hazards have entered the distribution system, identifying where they came from, of course, is a, a huge task in trying to isolate and identify that. So if it does reoccur, uh, it may be because the actual hazard was not prevented. We also see that the hazard as it goes into the system, how is it entering the system? Many people have the concept that as pollution or, has, or contamination hazards enter the distribution system, they'll just dissipate. Uh, the phrase of you know, the solution to pollution is dilution, assuming that the water will dis the hazard will dissipate in the large distribution system is probably not a good way to handle the hazard. Also, we find at times we'll find that the hazard will, will flow in a slug form. It won't dilute. It'll be a slug moving through the distribution system. And a number of backflow incidents over the years have shown where this full strength hazard has actually surfaced at a, another point in the distribution system and caused problems. And then we also look at what is actually backflowing. Is it a biological hazard or is it a chemical hazard? A lot of the existing water quality testing that's done in the distribution system obviously is for biological hazards. Uh, but we find that uh, in charting the actual types of backflow uh, issues, chemical contamination is uh, one, it's also a, a very large part of the number of backflow incidents that have occurred. So many times just standard biological testing may not show the chemical that may be in the system. So this is where we find it may occur, people may capture the event, but on many cases they can't because all the evidence is gone and they try to trace it back to its origin. Well, so we now have that backflow into the distribution system and let's say the event or the leak in the system is fixed and the water returns back to a normal condition and we now see that that pollution and contamination moves back through the distribution system and could now affect any customer along the line. When we first did this presentation, it was kind of interesting. Many of the people in the audience said, look, that pollution and the hazard went back to where it started from. It went back to its originator. And of course, that's a simplistic view of this, this illustration, but showing that once that contamination enters the system, it could flush back through the system and affect any customer along the way. So when we start talking about preventing backflow, one of the first barriers we typically look at uh, is putting the backflow preventer at the service connection where we feel hazards are present. So here we show the backflow prevention in some form of uh, mechanical assembly or method at the service connection there to really protect the integrity of the distribution system. So we think of it as a barrier, so that whatever is happening within that facility, within that water user's premises, 
will not flow back into the distribution system. So we feel this is one of the areas that many utilities look at as a form of backflow protection at the service connection. Well, if we take a look a little more closely now at our uh, distribution system, and let's zero in on that commercial or industrial user. And as we zero in on the facility, and if we lift the building out of the way, we'll see a very similar looking situation, another small distribution system within the building. So we normally think of that as the internal plumbing within a building. So again, going through the same basic uh, illustration here where we have different water uses, different water using equipment. Illustrated here, we may have boiler that has chemically treated uh, compounds in it, uh, different wash sinks, different water using equipment, hose bibs, etc. So the number of fixtures and water using equipment are numerous within any type of a facility. So if we look at that same internal plumbing system now, and let's say as the water flows in, it goes to all its respective uses within a building, within a residence too. Should there be some need for repair on that internal plumbing system and the water system is shut off? We've now suspended the water in the distribution system within the building. And then once that repair is made and maybe there may be a depressurization you see that without proper backflow protection at each of the water using fixtures or water using equipment, there could be a backflow within the internal plumbing system. Keep in mind, the backflow preventer out at the service connection prevents it from getting back into the distribution system. However, the contamination within the facility could be taking place. And now once the repair has been completed, and the water is now turned back on, and as this water re-enters the building and repressurized, this is where we're now going to find as water surface is turned back on, water goes back to all the internal uses, and as illustrated here, somebody could be consuming that. So this is where we have to look at the other side of the issue of providing internal protection at all water using equipment according to plumbing code requirements. So the backflow preventer out at service connection will provide protection to the distribution system, but we also have to look at the proper level of backflow protection within a premise to make sure the inhabitants or people within the facility are safe uh, in consuming the drinking water. 